Well, I'm very pleased to be talking about a topic that most physicians are familiar with, but oftentimes causes a lot of confusion when you get into the nitty gritty of trying to figure out what the syndrome is and what the best way of treating a patient is. How do you evaluate them and manage them? Uh, when you talk about Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, about one to 10% of all epilepsy clinics will have a patient with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome in them. And the reason that uh, they seem the range is so wide is because it depends on the level of the clinic. So if you have a new onset seizure clinic, you're going to see Lennox-Gastaut syndrome very rarely. But if you have a chronic epilepsy patient clinic, you're going to see a lot of Lennox-Gastaut patients. In a tertiary care epilepsy center, the incidence would be about 10%. Uh, when you look at population-based surveys, the incidence is a quarter of one in a thousand. So it would be 0.26 per thousand patients would be what would be in the general population. Of course, most of you who have worked in neurology clinics will realize that they occupy a significant portion of our time and resources. So to try and understand that, uh, we could go to the next. So what is Lennox-Gastaut syndrome? Uh, well, it is in its traditional form, it's a triad of seizures, uh, including tonic seizures, atonic seizures, and myoclonic or absence-like seizures. These would be atypical absence seizures. Uh, there is some confusion between the word typical and atypical, and really the difference between the two is an EEG-related uh, difference. Uh, with typical absence, which you see in childhood absence epilepsy, it, the frequency of the spike wave index is about three to four hertz per uh, second. Uh, in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, when you see an atypical absence, there are usually two spike and wave discharges per second, also called slow spike and wave discharges uh, uh, on the EEG. Now, Lennox-Gastaut is a syndrome is a syndrome, so it's not a disease. There are many causes for it, and the causes can be very varied. Uh, they can be associated with neonatal, in utero types of condition. Uh, they can be associated with cerebral palsy. They can be associated with other types of uh, etiologies that cause significant neurologic deficits. One very a big hallmark of the syndrome is that patients usually have mental retardation or cognitive impairment. The degree may vary, and there's certainly some patients that are mild uh, have mild impairment uh, of their cognition. Uh, this still would be one, tri one part of the triad uh, for the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Uh, the EEG, as I mentioned, is usually the hallmark. When you do see a, a very clear EEG, uh, the spike wave index is about 2 to 3 hertz per second, usually 1.5 to 2 hertz, uh, and it's referred to as slow spike in wave discharge, and you will see examples of this in future uh, slides. Uh, the other very typical factor is that these patients with lennox gastro syndrome drop. And when they drop, they hurt themselves. And the EEG will show you their, that there would be an associated electrodecremental response with this uh, particular drop. And those are usually seen with atonic seizures. Let's take the sp uh, slow spike and wave index. I've already talked to you about it. It is at 2 hertz, and that is the interictal uh, discharge rate that you would see. As I mentioned earlier, when the patient actually has a spasm or has a spell and falls, uh, you actually have an electrodecremental response. So there would be flattening or there would be absence of the spike wave index, which is opposite of what you're normally used to seeing. The seizure types are tonic seizures where the whole body stiffens. Usually a patient is propulsed forward with this type of seizure, sometimes backwards. Atonic seizures, and the last type is atypical absence. And not to be confused with typical absence seizures, which I talked about where the EEG is radically different. And the last point is the mental retardation, cognitive impairment we spoke about. When you put the three aspects together, the, the seizure type, the EEG characteristics, and the cognition, you have the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome triad. Now, in a particular patient, one aspect of this may not be as well developed as the others. For instance, a patient may have tonic and atonic seizures, but not have atypical absence seizures. The EEG may show slow spike and wave, but the majority of the EEG shows a very slow disorganized background. 
uh, and the degree of, of mental cognitive impairment is a wide spectrum. It can be from mental retardation uh, all the way to uh, autism or pervasive developmental delay, so a large spectrum with that. Now, we often say that children who have had West syndrome, which is infantile spasms plus hypsarrhythmia, grew up to have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. If the infantile spasms do, does not disappear, oftentimes those patients will develop Lennox-Gastaut syndrome at a later age. Uh, the causes, as I indicated to you, could be prenatal, perinatal, or neonatal. Uh, but oftentimes they could also be outside the neonatal uh, spectrum. And uh, examples of causes would be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or it could be a congenital malformation that occurred while during the second trimester or the third trimester of pregnancy uh, and uh, result in cortical malformations. It could also result from metabolic disorders uh, in, in the, as part of the etiologies. The classification of epilepsy syndromes is undergoing quite a transformation. Uh, in the 89 ILAE classification, we would talk of these as symptomatic or cryptogenic causes for it. Uh, symptomatic means it's a symptom of another neurologic uh, uh, disorder or deficit. Cryptogenic means that you can't identify a structural anatomic cause, but there's something that is causing the diffuse epilepsy plus uh, the uh, cognitive impairment. In the new ILE classification, which is still undergoing some transformation, you may hear uh, words as structural metabolic, uh, and structural metabolic refers to structural abnormality seen on neuroimaging, or metabolic as in metabolic disorders that might be causing this uh, syndrome. And some cases are referred to as unknown, and, and that probably makes up about 20% of patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. The EEG is critical in this diagnosis. You need a good EEG study, sometimes a video EEG study to, to really characterize the syndrome properly. Atonic seizures are asso associated with a diffuse electrodecremental response where the EEG would flatten uh, and be suppressed for a brief few seconds and then return to its prior background. Tonic seizures are usually fast frontal dominant uh, frequencies and atypical absence as I pointed out before is a slow spike in wave this is not to be confused with typical absence so the spike in wave index would be about 2 Hertz uh, the slow spike in wave patterns can be biphasic triphasic uh, but usually they are diffuse they may be more anteriorly do dominant but they're very diffuse bilateral bisynchronous type of discharges. If you remember what hips arrhythmia looks like, it's usually chaotic, multifocal. By the time you come up to three to five years of age when Lennox Gastor frequently presents, the EEG is going to transform into a more bisynchronous uh, abnormality rather than a multifocal abnormality. Very interesting ontogeny that takes place with that. The paroxysmal fast activity uh, is, as I mentioned, is, may last for about 15 to 20 seconds. It's usually bilaterally synchronous and uh, frontally dominant. Here is an example of what would be a slow spike in wave background. Notice that uh, the, this is a bipolar montage left uh, and right. And you can see that the, there is diffuse slow spike in wave discharges that dominate this EEG. There isn't a normal portion of this EEG, but unlike hypsarrhythmia where it's multifocal, these are anteriorly dominant <coughs> slow spike in wave discharges that take place. Uh, during sleep, the EEG will transform quite significantly, and you may have fragmentation of, uh, of these discharges, uh, and you may have faster frequencies seen in these discharges, so that is something to be aware of. The sleep patterns can significantly alter um, uh, the picture, as you can see in the slide. Now here is what you should definitely uh, remember. R look at the sensitivity of this. This is a thousand microvolts per millimeter. So this is a the EEG is very high amplitude uh, in real time. If you had to look at it at the more traditional 70 microvolts per millimeter. But just to illustrate the point, you can see that where you you see the patient with a marker saying the patient falls backwards. Uh, you can see that there's a diffuse discharge, and that is followed by a three-second electrodecremental discharge. Again, a very characteristic feature of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. 
If you will remember, this is also seen when a, in, in West syndrome where a patient has infantile spasms, you will see the same electrodecremental response, another hallmark of these two conditions indicating some transformation over the age uh, from where one progresses and transforms into the other, meaning infantile spasms transforms into lennox gastro syndrome, an important point to keep in mind. Now, drop attacks are the terror of these patients. When you walk into a clinic and you see a patient in your epilepsy clinic with a helmet on, chances are that patient is dropping. And drops are caused by three types of seizures. Uh, they could be uh, tonic seizures where the patient becomes very rigid and like a pole propels either backwards and hits the back of the head. Sometimes if they're depending on the posture, if they're uh, uh, leaning forward, they may actually propulse into the ground and hurt themselves. These are the children that damage teeth, fracture jaws, cut chins, and sustain significant abrasions and lacerations uh, with this syndrome. Uh, frontal, if the seizures are atonic, sometimes the patient is standing and suddenly as if the wind is taken out of their uh, feet, they just collapse to the floor and depending on where they fall and how they fall, they may injure themselves with these seizures. Myoclonic seizures are less typical. They, can, they are variable and the patient, depending on which direction the seizure is, uh, they could fall in that particular direction. The important point to remember is that with many of these syndromes, by the time the patient has hit the ground, the seizure has already disappeared. So they are aware of them falling and unable to do anything to prevent or break their fall. A very frightening condition and a very tragic condition that really highlights the importance of recognizing this syndrome. Now, the issue with mental retardation and cognitive impairment was, goes back to Lennox from uh, the 1960s. And what he showed in a very crude fashion is the number of seizures uh, increases the index of cognitive impairment. Now, this is difficult to say that the seizures themselves cause the cognitive impairment because you could have a patient with severe cognitive impairment and severe epilepsy. But it certainly brings up the point of being much more proactive about this condition uh, really recognizing it for what it is and, uh, uh, and being aware of it and treating it effectively. Very important. Uh, and you can see over here, just looking at the last bar where they have a thousand plus seizures. This is a very devastating, a very damaging condition. And uh, what was uh, also studied subsequently is a very interesting phenomenon which says that if you had earlier seizures, how cognitively impaired were you compared to later seizures? And not surprisingly, those with earlier seizures had more severe uh, cognitive impairment compared to those that developed the lennox gastro syndrome or other intractable catastrophic epilepsies at a later stage. Again, imp implying the importance of recognizing this condition, possibly effectively treating it, and managing the condition in a very humanistic way, taking into consideration not just the seizures and chasing every small myoclonic jerk with more medications, but really having a balanced approach uh, as we will talk about later in this presentation. Uh, the other problems associated with Lennox Gastro syndrome, it's very important. We talked about cognition, that is just one aspect of it. Uh, bone health is another very critical issue with these patients. Remember, these patients are not moving around as much as they should uh, and because of their disability. The second thing that's very important is they're on multi multiple medications which may impair bone formation and bone strength, uh, leading to osteopenia. Added to this, they frequently fall. And when you fall on a weakened bone, the chance of you fracturing that bone certainly goes up. So it's very important to be, be aware of the other aspects that go along with this syndrome often cause a lot of morbidity and are not as effectively treated or managed.